to inform to the public. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jane. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll start just a, a brief introduction about who we are, um, so you know a little background about us. Um, as, as Jane said, we're both ARBA judges, but I'm going to give an opportunity so you know a little bit more about us. I'll let uh, Pam begin uh, and just tell you a little bit about herself and her background, especially with some of these briefs. Hi, guys. Um, I am obviously Pam Jones, and I've been raising rabbits since 1972. And yes, kids, that is really a year. We had cars and TVs and everything. Um, I started in 4-H because I wanted to be involved in 4-H, but I didn't live on a farm, so I was able to get rabbits and so far just made in 4-H. I started with Champagne Diogens, but then soon found out about Netherlands Dwarfs, and my mom and I were totally hooked once we saw them, so we obtained some Netherlands Dwarfs, and I've raised them ever since. I've raised dwarf photos. Um, three different occasions for many, many years, had some national winners, and many other breeds besides those. So, a little bit about me, and... And, and as Jim said, I'm Jeff Harden. Um, I started just a couple years before Pam, back in 1969, and have been judging uh, since 1982. Uh, like Pam, I uh, started with Netherlands Dwarfs back in the 70s, and have, still have Nettleman Dwarfs today. Um, I was telling some folks before we started the Dwarf Hotos, uh, I was one of the charter directors of the Dwarf Hotos Club when they came over from Europe back in the 80s. Uh, Elizabeth Sportsinger and Louise Callum were two of the, the ladies that were very instrumental in bringing those animals over here to the United States back then. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice breed. And so today, um, we're challenged with looking at three of our smaller breeds, uh, which is the Nellon Dwarf, the Dwarf Hoto, and the Polish. And I will say to you, if you're raising rabbits, whether you're a youth member or an adult, if you don't have the ARBA standard of perfection, that is the best thing you can purchase. Um, if you get that, uh, I strongly encourage you to look at your breed, whatever breed it is, whether it's one of these three breeds, look at the standard in there, read that standard, understand what the meaning of those words are. Uh, an old friend of mine who was a judge for many years, Bobby Byrne, used to always say, words have meanings, and there's nothing more truer than that. Look at the word that's used in the standard and understand how it's meant, how it's applied to that rabbit in that breed. So I thought uh, to make this really easy, uh, if you're gonna do a comparison of breeds, it's really nice if you can actually have something to compare. So um, we looked at what we could do in terms of, of making this easy for everyone. And we put together a little, basically, it's a cheat sheet. And I love Delson. We come from the secretary's desk. And I love Delson. And it takes the three breeds here. And we took the standard and we looked at the major components of that breed. And we compared them. So. A little history about this, if you go through here and you look at the, the various components in this, this comparison, two of these animals, the wording, the descriptions of their characteristics are extremely similar. And if you look at that, and anybody who raises these, and a little audience participation, because it always looks good. But in terms of these three breeds, there's two of them that are very, very close in how they describe. And what are they? The dwarf and the dwarf hoto. And so the reason the dwarf and the dwarf hoto are extremely similar in their characteristics, they are, for all practical purposes, in every part of the world except the United States, the same breed. So if you go anywhere else that functions by a standard other than the ARBA standard, the dwarf hoto is simply another variety of the Netherland dwarf. And so it came from the same genetic pool the description of the head, the ears, the whole thing were exactly the same. So you say, well, if you look at this sheet, though, the, the dwarf home coat can be a little bigger than the Netherlands dwarf. And that goes back to the fact that I was always dirt in terms of knowing things. When they first came over, they were imported from a country where the dwarf standard allowed the weight to be a little larger. And so the lady said, 
Well, I don't want to do the work to get them down to two and a half pounds. I can bring them over at three pounds and just call them a different breed. And we didn't have internet. You know, it was snail mail, regular landlines, and all that. No one will know the difference. They're only going to know what I tell them. And that was true. The Americans thought, oh, this is a brand new breed. We'll put it in as a brand new breed as opposed to a variety of Netherlands dwarf. But if you now go on the internet and you search for dwarf hotos, it's not a separate breed in the world. It's simply a variety. Yesterday, the BRC had the Young Stock show. If you look at the picture, they have all the varieties of dwarfs lined up on the table. And there in the picture is one of the dwarf hotos. You can see it. So that's just a little history because if you understand in your mind, when you're looking at this breed, that it really, in essence, genetically, in most of its facets, is the same as your Netherland dwarf breed. That helps you kind of understand why things are the way they are. And, and Pam has raised both of these, too, and she'll tell you, um, a lot of the breeders in this breed have improved them over the years by using Netherland dwarfs. So, Always with a, a breed looking at weights, and we know that the largest breed on here is our, our Polish, and then we go down to the Nevlin Dwarf, and we have our Dwarf Hoko in the middle, and we know why there. That's the case. Posing, if you're going to evaluate a breed, posing is what you have to be able to do properly. And all three of these breeds are classified as compact breeds, which means proper posing is Front legs lined up with the eye, back leg lined up with the stifle joint. And Pam can, can put that's a little black polish, um, can kind of show you, demonstrate that piece of it. Um, and then they give you notes in each of those standards in terms of how those rabbits are to be posed. And part of it has to do with the characteristics. For example, under Polish posing, it says the only time you put your hand here is when you do the type. So you know once you get the animal posed, then everything else you're going to do, once you've evaluated the type with your hand here, then you're going to have to jerk your hand off. Because why? If you look at the points, what are you covering up? Uh, on the back sheet, real quick, you've got 15 points on the head, you've got 15 points on the ears, and you've got 15 points on the eye. 45 points is right here if you don't take your hand off this breed. And that's a, a big emphasis that I have to remind some judges who work with breeds that don't have all those points, because they're used to doing this number. And Pam, you want to show them what they're used to doing? This is what they're doing. And if anybody's on Facebook, you'll see it. And if you ever see my comments, I'll usually make a comment, sometimes a little snarky, about where's its head? Because people want to do this because they want to shove the head into the shoulders to make it look deeper, to make it look like there's more depth over the body. So they'll take their hands over their head and here. This guy's not even letting me do it. But shove that head in, shove their back end in, and then you can make it look as, as deep as you can. Is that the right kind of pose? And like Jeff said, what are you covering up? Half of the points, almost half of the points. And the other thing with the Nellon Dwarfs now, posing on those has gotten to be just the opposite. Um, and if Pam wants to take out the, the dwarf there, again, if you look at most of the posing on the Nellon Dwarf, you think that a, a Nellon Dwarf can't exist without a hand in the picture. Because the, the thing with the, the Nellon Dwarf has become this. Well, if you read the standard, what does the standard say? It's a special note in there to judges. It says, judges, don't encourage them to stand up. They should not be erect on their front feet. And the other thing it says is, you should not see daylight from the side, and nor should you see daylight under here. So if you see daylight there or daylight here, that animal's not posed properly. They want the animal in a nice, natural position. And people say, well, we have to do this because that elevates the head and gets it off the table. The key to getting the head off the table is to have proper depth at the shoulder. If the animal is structurally built correctly, you see, I don't have to hold my hand under her head. Her head's not here. And then the other thing, if you look at the body type on the sheet, it tells you 
that the depth of the shoulder carries back to the hind quarter. So you're supposed to come back here and then round off. Critically, she needs to round off just a little bit further over that hind quarter. But the key point is she starts here and she goes back and then rounds. And it's not because I'm holding her head up. Because nine times out of ten, you take your hand off of this head, it flops on that table. And the reason why, it's got a shoulder that's about this high structurally. So you just need to to really look at your standard and understand how the standard says for posing. Because once you pose them correctly, then you can do a correct evaluation. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the different points for each one, but the big distinguishing points are, for example, with the heads. We basically have the Nevelin Dwarf head, which is very similar to the Dwarf Hoto head, in terms of being bold, being wide, being well filled. The only exception is an Ellen Dwarf standard does talk about the fact that this head should be round in every direction and it should bounce. And also if you notice here on the front of this sheet, the Ellen Dwarf standard is the only one that talks about balance. The key thing, that's a lot of emphasis on balance. The head, the body, the ears are all supposed to be in a harmonious balance with each other. So it's no better to have this huge head with a faulted body or have a wonderful body with a small head or super thick ears but only a fair head. The thing about it is the head has to be round this way. The head has to be round this way. It should be a ball for all practical purposes. And if you look at this rabbit, that's not a round head. The head is more oblong. She has tremendous width though, I mean from the front. But in terms of a skull structure, the head needs to round this way. And it needs to be round this way. And that's a lot of things we now talk about. Oh look, that's a really massive bold head. But is it round? The other thing is, this head here in terms of size of the head should be harmonious with the size of the body. So if you think about a Neville and Dwarf being made up of two balls in the body, and this is how big they are, you should have a ball here of the same size, and that is a balance. Um, the Polish head's a little different, and Pam, you want to talk about how his head is, or her head is different? Sure. First I want to ask, does anybody know what Jeff meant when he said um, that it should not show daylight? Is there anybody that's not quite sure what that meant? Feel free, because if you don't know, your neighbor probably doesn't know. Everybody knows what you mean by showing daylight? All right, cool. Just want to make sure. Um, now, basically, with your Polish head, in, when I describe a Polish, I like to just describe a commercial rabbit, but tiny. So, um, with that head, you do want it um, full. You want it full cheeks and a full muzzle. But you don't want that overall roundness like you do in the dwarf and the dwarf hoto. Um, and it, it's not round in all directions. So you, you want that shape of the head to be just really, really pleasing and balanced, even though it doesn't say balanced in their standard, you want it to balance with the body um, and the slight roundness in between the eyes and a good bold eye. Very important in Polish. Another thing that's unique about the Polish is its ears in terms of the structure of the ears and how they must stand. The Polish standard is the only one of these three standards that say that those ears are supposed to be set at a nice base but also touch all the way from the base to the tip. And again, the importance of taking your hand off that head is so you can actually see those ears. And so when you view the ears from the front, they should actually touch all the way from a nice strong base to the very tip. You don't want to see flanges, you don't want to see fins, and you don't want to see gaps. It's all a fat and a cold standard. Uh, and the other thing is, Pam said, a nice big bold eye. Um, we see over the years the eyes on the Polish are getting smaller and smaller. They're getting like normal looking. But both the Polish and the North talk about big bold eyes specifically on those. And as Pam said, this is somewhat like a small um, 
what we would say normal pipe rabbit. And I say normal pipe in that the, the dwarf hoto, as well as the Nevelin dwarf, say that the sides are supposed to be basically parallel. The width of the shoulders, the width of the hind quarter is supposed to be very similar, if not the exact same. On the Polish, we want a nice taper so that you go back from the hind quarters to a slightly smaller shoulder. And again, the top line on the Polish is distinctly different because it rises up here, goes up, and then around, where your Nevelin dwarf starts high, carries straight back, and then on the dwarf hoto standard, it says a small or gradual rise to that hind quarter. But again, you want the head on that dwarf hoto to be somewhat at a natural position, and you get a slight rise on those. Even though genetically, historically, that rabbit used to have the exact same height as this one has. The other big difference, fur. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, how many of you guys are in 4 H? All right, so you know the different types of fur. Not that you have to be in 4 H to know that, but as a also 4 H does, that's typically one of my questions at the different fur types. So, different fur types, we've got night and day right here. What kind of coat does the Nevelin dwarf have? Shut it up. Roll that, right. What kind of coat does a dwarf hoto have? Roll that, right. What about a Polish here? Fly that, right. So, um, shorter, snappier, I like to call it. Equally as dense, so density, how much fur in, on the body in, in the area. So they can be equally as dense, but this one's going to roll back when you, when you stroke it uh, from tail to head. It's going to just roll back nice and slow and gradually. This polish might be a little more difficult to see since it's black, but it snaps back into place quickly. So definitely different different types of fur. Usually, feeling it is the best way to make the comparison, especially if you can get them side by side. This dwarf hoto has a very nice rollback coat, a little more finished than this dwarf. But, um, you want to say else and the big that? thing with the fur is, the standard does put a disqualification on the Polish if they have rollback fur. So if you get an animal that has this type of rollback fur, it is a disqualification. Uh, the other three things, that, the one thing that these three have in common is, which I didn't mention when we talked about head and body and that sort of thing, is a dewlap. A dewlap is a disqualification in all three breeds. And there is a caveat. The Polish, it says, allow for a pencil line. So you go, well, what is a pencil line as opposed to a dewlap? Well, it's real easy to tell a dewlap from a pencil line. If you ever suspect that a rabbit has a, a dewlap here as opposed to a pencil line, if you pinch that, and I don't have one here that has it, so there's nothing to pinch on these. And when you pinch it, if you feel skin between your fingers, and I was taught this years ago by a, a really good judge, Paul George Lomas, when I was for my registrar's life. If you have skin between those fingers, that's not a pencil line, that's a dewlap. But if you only have fur, that's a pencil line. And some pencil lines look terrible. I mean, they look like the biggest dewlap you've ever seen, but when you pinch them, it's pure fur. And that's the distinction, and it's real easy to do. Those two fingers tell you everything you need to know. You don't do it with your eyes because that's deceptive. You'll think some of these animals have a dewlap, or you'll say, well, why did that judge place that rabbit with that big dewlap? Well, ask the breeder, you know, can I actually feel this? And you'll feel that fur there. So that's something that's across the board, a disqualification. Um, and we're probably getting close to our time. Um, so are there specific questions we can answer for any of these three breeds for anybody? Yes. So I'll tell you historically what happened. With any new breed, there's one thing that gets in a lot of people's eyes. 
Monday. So they want a lot of them and they want it quick. And so as soon as they arrived here, they immediately started crossing it with a multitude of breeds. They crossed it with dwarfs, they crossed it with Polish, and they even crossed it with Florida whites. So you saw all three of those breeds suddenly put into that rabbit, which distinctly changed it. It changed his head, it changed his ears, it changed his fur, it had some faults in there that we never want. And of course, we typically just Americanize everything. I hate to say it, but most breeds we bring into this country, we have to change them to make them an American kind of breed. Which I think we've changed the door, the Nedla door, much, much more so structurally to fit what we want here in the United States because back when we first started in dwarfs, the dwarf was simply a brick with its rounded corners. Does anybody know what in our standard calls for that description? Katie. So if you kind of take a Katie, that's really what the dwarf standard used to call for. A brick with the, with the corners rounded off. So obviously, we've changed that quite a bit. And if, if you're on Facebook with either Jeff or I, you'll see a lot of pictures from Europe and overseas. And the dwarfs and most of their breeds are posed much differently. They don't, they don't have the, the um, lower shoulders and real deep hind quarters. They kind of pull everything up. Please report to the secretary's desk, Jaden Owen. Most of these over there have just a little bit different structure and shape to them. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. No further questions. I want to thank Pam and Jeff for their time. It was an excellent presentation. Most of you know I'm around a lot, as I live in this area, please feel free to, to ask. Judges are usually thrilled is to answer questions, try to help you out. If we don't know the answer, which we don't know all of the answers, we'll try to find the answer for you. So you guys have a great day. Thank you all.